Hey gang, today we are in Colorado, actually Glenwood Springs, Colorado, and we're at a cemetery called Linwood. Some famous people buried here from the western frontier, and let's just start with Doc Holliday. You've all heard of Doc Holliday, but we're also going to visit another grave, a, a pair of graves is said to be the graves of a very infamous serial killer family, the Bloody Benders. That'll be part two, but back to Doc Holliday. We're gonna walk to his grave, we're gonna tell his story. But before we do, let me just clarify something. Now, many of you guys know on my channel I'm a uh, history nut, and with respect to that, my favorite genre or area of scope, if you will, is Western frontier history. From the mountain men to the Indian War, all the way, of course, down to Arizona, especially the frontier outlaws, the frontier lawmen, the vigilantes. And I just want to clarify one thing. I probably read most of the books. And here's the thing. Everything that we're going to talk about today, 50% of it you can throw out the window because all of those books that you read, that any of you read, there's there's no way to know for certain. A lot of stuff has been made up. And we'll start with Stuart Lake's book, going all the way back. Most of that book was, boy, it was great to read. That was my introduction to Wyatt Earp. But sadly, a lot of that is said to be fiction. And you come all the way to the 1970s, a guy named Glenn Boyer, I remember reading his book along with others, I Married Wyatt Earp, the manuscripts of Josephine Earp, nicknamed Sadie, it is said that that's based on a bunch of made-up stuff. Book ended with some real stuff, the tombstone anyway. So as we walk and talk, you know, you can correct me all you want, but what I've done is from my experience, in my head going back, parceling what I think is fact from fiction, but I'm not gonna get it all right. But anyway, let's take a walk. Let's uh, talk about Doc Holliday. And let's visit his grave. This is a beautiful old cemetery. Now to get up here, you have got to walk about a quarter mile uphill in the thin air. So you do have to be in some shape. And I'm not going to say I barely made it, but I'm still getting back in shape after knee surgery this winter. But anyway, Doc Holliday, let's talk about old Doc. John Henry Holliday was his full name. He was born 814, August 14th, 1851, back in Georgia, in Griffin, Georgia. And in 1864, his family moved within Georgia to a place called Valdosta. Now, in 1866, when he was 15 years old, his mom passed away, and this will be a familiar term of tuberculosis. Same disease that killed his adopted brother, actually. He attended school. Of course, he not only became a dentist, but he really majored, if you will, in rhetoric. <laughs> we know that. We know how he got that way. Grammar, but also mathematics, history, and languages. Principally Latin. So he was a pretty smart guy, but yeah, you can, you can get it with the rhetoric and grammar. I'm sure his sharp tongue won many a verbal fight. In 1870, he was 19 years old. He went to Philadelphia, and in 1872, in very early spring, in March, he was 20 years old, he finally got his dental surgery degree, Pennsylvania College of Dental Surgery, which is, which is actually now part of the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine. He graduated five months before his 21st birthday, so he had to wait until he turned 21. But he moved to St. Louis after that, and he was working as, a, as an assistant for his classmate. 
and he was getting experience. And about four months later, end of July, he went to Atlanta. And that's where he joined a dental practice there. He was living with his uncle, and when he was building his practice there, he contacted the infamous disease we all know of tuberculosis. So he was given a few months to live, but hey, get to drier climates and you might last longer. So he went to Dallas. Pretty, pretty well uncivilized at the time. It was still frontier. And of course, he's coughing away. He's trying to practice dentist and he's gagging on his patients. So that all declined. But he, he, he discovered that he was pretty good at gambling. And that would be his principal income. He would pivot to that. Well, it was time to head farther west. And that he did. Headed near here, Denver, following the stage routes and gambling towns and army outposts all along the way. But this is when he was really starting to develop what I'm going to call his real smart-ass, wicked attitude, which would lead to a lot of confrontations. Let's go this way. It was about that time he started to settle in Denver when the first story came out about Doc. It was a guy named Tom Mackey. And that was his name. He used as an alias and he was working as a faro dealer. And it didn't take long before he got into an argument with a guy named Bud Ryan, who was a tough guy, a gambler there. And they both drew their knives and they fought it out. Guess who won? Doc Holliday. He didn't kill Ryan, but he left him seriously wounded. Well, he heard gold was calling, and in 1877, he returned to Cheyenne, and then he headed down to Kansas, so he was on the move. He left Kansas, he went to Breckenridge, Texas, gambled some there, he had a disagreement, 1877 with a gambler named Henry Kahn, and he beat him repeatedly with his walking stick. Both men arrested, but Kahn wasn't finished. Later that day, he came back and he shot Holiday. Holiday was unarmed. He almost killed him. So Holiday's like, I better get out of here. So Doc didn't always win all his, all his fights. He didn't win them all. Now, it was at Fort Griffin in Texas. He was dealing cards at John Shancy Saloon, and that's where he met Big Nose Kate, the famous Big Nose Kate, Mary Catherine Honore. She was a dance hall woman and occasional prostitute. Of course, her nose, she's known for her nose, big nose Kate. She, yeah, I look at the pictures, kind of had a prominent nose. I wouldn't say it was big, but boy, what a nickname, huh? Tough deal for her. She was pretty stubborn like Doc. She was pretty fearless. So they would get into some tussles. Now, this is where he met Wyatt Earp. And if any of you know, don't know who Wyatt Earp is, he is probably the most famous lawman that ever lived. And it was there where he was, uh, Wyatt Earp was there chasing this Dave Rudabaugh guy. He was a guy who robbed the Santa Fe Railroad. And he was on the run and Wyatt was after him from Dodge City. So he went to the Beehive Saloon, 
which was the big saloon of John Shanacy, Shanacy, where Earp, he met up with Doc. Because he asked Shanacy, who do you know? Who do you know who would know where Rudabaugh went? And he said, hey, right over there, see, see that guy sitting at the table? His name's Doc Holliday. He was gambling with him, go ask him. So he did. So he got some leads on that and all of that really led to kind of an initial friendship. Kind of an initial friendship between the two. Now these are metal. These are metal. Of course those last a lot longer. You wonder if those are replacements or not, but we have some veterans here. A lot of the graves here are fenced in. And I'm just kind of wandering. Let's take a look up here. Look at these mountains, guys. It's absolutely stunning. So we're kind of getting off the path. Let's go up. Let's get back to it. I'm going to go up this way. But it's really neat. You can't drive cars in here. It's all meandering footpaths. About a month after Fort Griffin, Earp returned to Fort Clark and in early 1871 he went to Dodge City where he was the assistant city marshal under Charlie Bassett. And it was the summer of 1878 where Holiday and Big Nose also came to town. But there was a big incident there. Of course, Holiday was trying to practice dentistry. That wasn't working out so good, so he was at the tables, and luckily he was in the same bar where these uh, there was a run-in that Wyatt had with two cowboys, Toby Driscoll and Ed Morrison out of Wichita. And that was earlier, and they, they were in town, and these guys got like a dozen other cowboys, and they were coming to kill Earp. And they had a big confrontation. They had a big confrontation in the bar there. And Doc is sitting in the back, and he's, you know, he's just kind of watching. But he loved Wyatt Earp, man. He was like, because he looked up to him. He respected him. Because Wyatt was no pushover either. It wasn't a kiss ass. Anyway, these guys had him cornered. And they were about to shoot Wyatt. And Doc just comes out of nowhere, pulls his gun, and puts it to the, to the guy's head. I think it was Toby's head said let's go what do you want to do so everybody disbanded go figure smart move because you know what Doc was getting completely well he was gonna die of tuberculosis who cares and it was said that he said I don't care I'm gonna die with my boots on so maybe those guys knew maybe they didn't but they were lucky that they backed off. And let me tell you something, Wyatt Earp never forgot that. That's what cemented their relationship, was that whole deal. And they would never, uh, Wyatt would always be behind Doc in all his scrapes. Well, they ended up going to Tombstone. I mean, it was the Earps. I think it was James and Gang and his older brother and his wife, who was a part-time prostitute or she was reformed. Anyway, they, they said Tombstone's where we're going. That's where the latest rumors are of all this silver being found at Shefflin. So they headed down there and that's where the action really started because Doc followed, Doc and Kate. 
Some say they went with them. I think they arrived after, but again, this is one of these facts where it's really hard to determine as they all ended up in Tombstone. And as we arrive in Tombstone, we arrive at John Henry's grave, Doc Holliday. We are on the edge of a cliff here. And this is it, guys. This is the, it's beautiful. There's a stone here that says, this memorial dedicated to Doc Holliday, who was buried someplace in the cemetery. Now, isn't that interesting? So was he buried unmarked? He must have been. I was under the impression this was actually his grave, but guys, I did some more research and we're gonna talk about this. I'm gonna finish the story, but there's conjecture on if he's even here in Colorado. We'll talk about that at the end. Uh, looks like somebody left some, some rum. You know that Doc likes that. He was a heavy drinker. I mean, he was on a spiral mission. He didn't care what was gonna happen. And that's why people were really afraid of him. He was, a, he was just a powder keg. So to Arizona they go, and I'm not gonna get into the whole story, but you know, it all built up. I mean, the Earps were there to try to make a living. They were there to prospect and they made claims. Well, we had old man Clanton. We had that whole cowboy gang as they called themselves. They were rustling cattle from over the border south, the Rio Grande. They'd go way deep into Mexico. They'd bring it back. They'd fence it. And, you know, it was obviously a, a conflict with Virgil Earp, Earp, especially becoming town marshal or town constable, but he, it was bound to happen. And sure enough, it was. Let's see, it was Frank McLowry, it was Tom McLowry, after Tom was buffaloed by Wyatt, I think earlier in the day, which means he took his pistol and whipped him over the head, because he was being a, a you-know-what. Billy Claiborne and Ike Clanton were there. Who am I forgetting? You got the McLowry brothers, we got Ike Clanton, Billy Claiborne. They called him Billy the Kid, and it was Ike. Ike and Billy that ran, and then it was, it was really Billy Clanton and the McLowrys who took the brunt of it. They were all killed. And it is, and, and by the way, you see the famous scene where the Earps are walking up the street, and that, you know, that happened. And then Doc Holliday joined in, and it was Morgan Doc, and this is probably true, where they were whispering to each other, let's, Let's kill them. Like, they had enough of these guys. They were supposed to be not carrying weapons in town, but they were purposely trying to start start a row, these cow, you know, the cowboys. And at the OK, adjacent the OK Corral, and by the way, I gotta tell you, I went, I've been to Tombstone a couple times, it's sad, it's so touristy. But I gotta tell you, I, I, I went to see the reenactment, and I got up halfway and I walked out, and everyone's like, where are you going? Because it was so unlike what I'm a purist. Sorry, I'm spoiled of the fun. But it was really, really cheesy and bad, guys. Sorry, it's just my opinion. So what happened? Those guys got uh, shot. It was really because uh, either Morg or it was again it was Morgan Earp, Virgil Earp, it was Wyatt Earp, and Doc Holliday. And it was Morgan Doc that probably started this thing. Or it started at the same time, but those two were just itching to kill these guys. So it erupted and that's, that was the outcome. And then, you know, make a long story short, you've got the revenge. They shot up Virgil with shotguns and then they had, at Hatch's saloon, they got Morgan in the back while he was playing pool. Whole sad story. And then they tried to ambush them up in Tucson, Stillwell and gang, and I think Ike was there and a whole bunch of them at night. 
Well, he got his. They killed him on the tracks. Pumped him full of shotgun holes. And then it was the vigilante mission, which Doc was part on. And they went after and one by one tried to kill all these guys. They got Indian Charlie and they got, in the end, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but they got, they got Curly Bill. And again, did it really happen that way? But Curly Bill never showed his face again. Standoff with Wyatt Earp. He got his shots missed. I'm sure that's a little bit of fiction. But he never showed his face again. Curly Bill, he was gone, wiped out. He would have been bragging if he was not killed. So Doc Holliday, you know, he ended up here, you know, everybody went their separate ways. And Doc Holliday ended up coming here because his tuberculosis was getting worse and worse and worse. And this is, this is where he died. And that is a fact. He died here in Glenwood Springs. He was on his deathbed, you know, he had, he had nurses. And the last thing they said, or she said that he said was he, he looked down at his feet and he goes, this is funny. And the remark, it is said that he was probably referencing the fact that he was sure to die with his boots on. That would be gunned down rather than die sick in a hospital bed. So, who knows? Who knows the real story? Now the real question is, is he even here? Is Doc Holliday even here in Glenwood Springs? Is he even here at Linwood Cemetery? Because many say that his father, who was very powerful in, back in Georgia, Major Henry Holliday, who was quote unquote a man of means and influence. They said he came out here and he, he got Doc and brought him back to Griffin, Griffin's Oak Hill Cemetery. And it is said that father and son are buried together. So what do you guys think? Do you think he's, do you think he's here in this area or do you think he's back in Georgia? Now, how do you figure that out? Maybe it'll be like, it'll probably be just like Dillinger, they tried to dig him up, or H.H. Holmes, DNA, 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 right? They'll probably do that someday, because there is an unnamed grave there next to his father, I guess. So, who knows? Maybe they will solve the riddle. But they sure won't solve it here, because this is just a monument here at Linwood. Well, rest in peace, John Henry Holiday, wherever you are, wherever you might be. As we head up the dusty trail for another story, part two tomorrow, gang.